As a kid that grew up in the 80s and 90s, there will always be a love in me for the Lamborghini Diablo. Now, of course, I maintain that the Murcielago is my favorite car, and it is a better car than a Diablo, but I will concede that in some circumstances, the Diablo is a cooler car. It's just there's nothing like the presence of a Diablo. Now, I've only owned one of them. It was a 1997 Diablo Roadster that I had two years ago, and it was rather short-lived. It had an amazing story being stolen and repainted and been swapped and seized by the FBI and sold super cheap, and it was definitely the cheapest run Diablo that ever transacted, but because I needed money for the $599 and I needed a rationale to offset the purchase price of the $599 for Car Trek 6, and because I fundamentally did not fit in the car, I sold that car in a Hoovy style flip to Patrick Adair, and he's been restoring that car on his channel and it is amazing. But I always wanted another one, and I just never really knew which one to target. But a few months ago, Matthew Ivanhoe, the cultivated collector who's sat here and told many amazing stories, called me and said that he'd found a Diablo that was kind of right up my alley. And generally that means it's a terrible automobile. So I was very, very interested. And the car in question was a 1997 Lamborghini Diablo SV in Rosso Imola sitting in Japan. And this was not the kind of car that he would normally buy or the kind of car like Tamarian at Curie would buy. It was not a nice example of a Diablo, but it was supposedly a running and driving car, but it was sort of modified in a Yakuza style. Now, I don't know that it was owned by a gang member, but in talking to Steve from Steve's POV, he saw the way it was and certain touches that made him think it very well could be. In particular, it had rhinestones glued around the interior air vents and on the shifter. And apparently that's some sect of the Yakuza's like trademark thing or whatever, but it had this really cool 7,000 license plate on it. And, you know, had all of the normal big wing, giant wheels, underbody lighting, all the things that you would expect out of a crazy modified Japanese Lamborghini. Of course, I was immediately intrigued by it, and we started looking at what we could do to figure out really what the state of the car was, which meant an immediate Lemon Squad style inspection of whatever they had available over there in Japan. And then you have to go out bidding on this car in their like arcade style auctions. Now, he was helping to manage that through a person in Japan. I wasn't the one bid, 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 but you know, these are like one minute long auctions and you never know even if you win, if you're gonna get the car. The first time it ran, we won at a price that was a little higher than we wanted to pay, but we were trying to be comfortably back of US valuations. And in fact, even with that bid, we didn't get the car. I guess every time the seller can choose whether or not to accept the bid, it's kind of like there's not a reserve, but there's always a reserve. I don't really know, but whatever. We didn't own this car. I kind of forgot about it. But two weeks later, he called and said, Ed, we got it. I said, we got what? Oh, the Diablo. Yes, absolutely. And so we did in fact bought at that time for less money, which was even better. And shipping prices were starting to go back down. He was looking at another car coming out of Japan. We could consolidate. The stars were aligning for me to own this terrible example of a really cool car, which is always what I'm trying to accomplish. And so in preparation, we had some of these cool shirts made because this was going to be a partnership with Glossit. Every year for the past three years, I've kind of tried to find a car that Rich and his team could partner with Vinwiki and we could do some kind of collaborative project. And in this case, unlike the SLR, which just needed a cosmetic reconditioning, or the Spiker, which had been sitting for so long and really needed to be rejuvenated using all the Glossit products, this car was going to need quite a transformation. If you would like one of these amazing Glossit Vinwiki Japanese license plates, shirts, you can have one for free if you buy the offer at the link in the description below. And that is Glossit's DIY Graphene Coating Bundle. Of course, yours won't be this wrinkly. This one rode back in the trunk of the Rolls Royce, but uh, it'll be nice, brand new, and it'll go with your shiny new car, because I have to say, I do honestly love all of Glossit's products. They do a great job, so check them out at the link in the description below to help them continue to support all the craziness that we do here at Venwiki. So the car set at the port in Japan forever. Nothing is happening fast, but there was some congestion around the Panama Canal that slowed down shipping throughout the Pacific. That was a nightmare, but that really didn't matter because I didn't have a whole lot of immediate need for this Diablo. Now, what I didn't expect was that a short time after that, I would accidentally buy a blue Lamborghini Murcielago on cars and bids. That sort of interfered with the money that came out of the Mercy SV and we sort of went into the Diablo and now I had to call Premier Financial to get a loan for the blue car. One or maybe even both will be on the chopping block before too terribly long, but 
I was super duper excited to have this Diablo whenever it got here. Now, as the delays happened and as eventually it made its way, it was starting to press up against our planned drive in the US Express. Now, I recently made a video talking about driving a 50-year-old Rolls-Royce across the country in a revitalization of the US Express events from the 1980s through Taylor Hall's event alongside John Ficarra and Trevor Hermosillo from Sway. And so we did that and the Diablo was supposed to clear customs like the Thursday before we arrived. And so that was going to be at the port in Long Beach. And so we ended up, as baller as this sounds, asking them to flatbed the Diablo to the valet at the port of Fino so I could drive across the country in my Rolls Royce and take delivery of my brand new Lamborghini. Now, of course, that was the worst Rolls Royce you could get somewhere in and the worst Lamborghini that you could possibly just buy and start driving sight unseen. But the roundabout plan was to pick up the car in LA and then drive it to SEMA in Las Vegas to continue the journey and then undergo a transformation with Rich and his team at Glossed. That was a lot of very unreliable car miles turning into a crazy journey, and so I had very little hope that all of the things would go to plan, but miraculously, we made it to the Portofino in the rolls. That was clearly the biggest hurdle, and the car did quite well. You can see the video about that journey on the channel, but as I pulled in, I asked Doug Tabbitt, who was already there waiting at the finish line. He'd flown in, not driving in the event. I said, where is the Diablo? He said, I think it's over there in the valet, and of course, that was the next stop. So we walk across the Portofino parking lot to the valet area and there it sits with all the auction markings in Japanese and just disgusting, as dirty as a car could possibly be. And unsurprisingly, it was dead as a doornail, but they had the car, they had the key. And so we opened it up and I pulled the jump box, the little smaller one that I carry around in our Vinwiki Cannonball Survival Kit. And that was not remotely up to the task of starting this car. But fortunately, one of the valets had some jumper cables and we hooked it up and the thing fired right up. And surprise of all surprises in this entire equation, is that on ignition, all of the dash lights were functional, and on starting, they all went off. Now, a Diablo without a check engine light on is quite a phenomenon, but the thing sounded good. It revved smooth, and I mean, and honestly, the aesthetics were as bad as I expected them to be. There was some peeling paint and some goofy modifications and all this stuff, but you know, it was a real car that seemed like it would really go somewhere, which of course we had to immediately put to the test in the post cannonball drive to Denny's, because it's the only place in Redondo Beach that's open to serve breakfast in the middle of the night. And so we took it over there. Of course, it only has a thimble worth of gasoline in it, like most cars that ship across the ocean. So I didn't know how long that was going to last, which was an extra problem because Diablos of some ages have a lockable fuel door. And that key is not the ignition key, and that key was not included with this car. Of course, when you buy a car sight unseen across an ocean, you don't really get books and service records and keys and stuff like that. So it was a total unknown, and this was going to be a bit of a problem, but we decided in our delirium from driving all night that it was going to be a problem for the next day. So we ate some Denny's, went back, rested for a little while at the Portofino, and then got up as some of the teams continued to arrive from the US Express, one of which was, of course, driven by Jared Pink, our lovely car trek mechanic, in the questionable garage. We were talking about different ways to drill the lock and do different things. And Cameron Davis from DC Motor Works had just won the event in his 450 SEL 6.9 with his co-driver Aaron Tulin. And so they were there to <laughs> celebrate also that the roles that Cameron had spent a lot of time wrenching on had survived the journey. And of course, marveling at my latest purchase or irresponsibility as the case may be. So we were all looking at it. Aaron tried to take the outer apparatus out. That didn't work and the backing plate fell down. And then Jared had the bright idea to just pull the wheel off, pull the fender liner, get into the body panel and take it out from the inside, which worked just fine. Of course, then we needed to duct tape over the opening so that the fuel would not slosh out. But ultimately we were able to drive the car across town, put some gasoline in the car and prepare for the next day's journey. Because the very next morning we were all going to road trip to SEMA. Taylor Hull and his wife were coming along, Christopher Michaels and Ben Charlie Safari Wilson from the the C2C Express were coming. Of course, Jared Pink in the convoy very necessarily on my part. And I was going to drive the Diablo and Trevin and Emma from Sway were going to take the Rolls Royce. Now, Arnie needed a ride. He'd also flown into the Portofino and wanted to get to SEMA and the cherry blossom covered Diablo passenger seat was available. We lined it up, took some good pictures and set out for a four and a half to five hour road trip. Now, the plan was since the battery was totally dead in the Diablo and we wanted to avoid push starting it any more than we already 
had, we would generally leave it running for the couple of fuel stops that we would need. Now it should take again, four and a half, five hours. I think it probably took us six to seven, but our car, the Diablo, was not the one that made everybody stop. We had a couple of issues with the 6.9 and a few other reasons to go fairly slow, but ultimately blasting across the desert in a newly purchased Lamborghini that you have no idea what's gonna happen, what could be more cannonball than that other than the cannonball that we had just actually done from New York? And so ultimately, we made it. We arrived at Glossett's headquarters in Las Vegas. Now, it was gonna be kind of an anti-SEMA transformation because the car was already overly modified and I kind of prefer a car in its most stock form. Now, the biggest part of that was some of the parts that were sort of missing or replaced on this Diablo. Now, fortunately, through Alex Hess in Germany, who I'd sourced my Murcielago SV from, I'd said, hey, do you have a line on any of the stock things that I'm gonna need? Fortunately, he had all of it. He had a set of stock wheels, he had the stock wing, he had the stock rear bumper, which had been deleted on this car, stock exhaust tips, all the stuff we really needed to turn the car into a factory-looking SV that was gonna need some paintwork and things like that. But ultimately, he sent those over. I got a set of the perfect factory graphics from John Tamarian at Curated, and they were all actually <laughs> riding with Freddy's P1 in Arnie's trailer because it was coming down from Chicago to pick the car up in Florida. He stopped, picked up my crate of stuff that had shipped in from Germany, and it was all to SEMA. So there were so many moving parts in this entire equation, and magically, everything had aligned, everything had worked, no cars had broken down, and we had made it to Glossit. And that is where the transformation began, and that'll be the next video on this Diablo. SV, but it is the latest Lamborghini, and I have to say, you know, I was worried about not being able to fit in the car. I assumed that we'd have to pull the seat out of it for me to be able to fit to drive it across the desert to get to Vegas, but honestly, I fit great. The car ran great. I loved it. So I loved it even more than I thought I was going to love it, which was already a lot. So I was so excited to get it there to gloss it, let the transformation begin, and I'm sure you'll love what happens in the next video. Of course, we have to thank Glossip for their support of this video and so many things that we do here at VinWiki. Their transformation of the Diablo is going to astonish you in our next video. But if you would like a 7,000 Japanese license plate shirt for free, all you have to do is buy their DIY graphene ceramic coating bundle. So check it out now at the link in the description below. Get you some Glossip goodness and thank them for their support of VinWiki.